Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden. Where we continue to follow the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden now. Those are just some of the scenes overnight as thousands of Americans gathered in celebration of Osama bin Laden's death. Former Navy SEAL Rob O'Neill says he has thought about the mission every day since that May Day in 20. From multiple conversations you had with Rob O'Neill over the past year and a half, how'd you get And you described that his head kind of exploded yes, when you hit I, him. I actually hit him three times because I shot him twice when he was standing and once on the ground. That is the fucking American badass. Go, go, go. We are not going for fame and we are not going for bravado. We are going for the single mom who dropped her kids off at elementary school on a Tuesday morning, and then 45 minutes later, she jumped to her death out of a skyscraper. If you need help, hang up and then dial your operator. I'm Rob O'Neill, and this is the Operator Podcast. Like the man said, this is the Operator Podcast. I'm your host, Robert J. O'Neill. Former special operator in the U.S. Navy. Um, it's also the name of the book that I wrote, uh, I think, in 2017, The Operator. And what I was um, meaning by the title, The Operator, is that is a memoir about the life of the operator. In that case, uh, for example, I was um, talking about the life of the operator and my journey into being an operator. Uh, there's a lot of operators in the military, and mine's just a journey of how I started off in Butte, Montana, and just the little decisions that you can make in life can have such a huge impact on your life later. Uh, I never would have imagined that I um, <laughs> would be where I am now. Shit. I would have told you at SEAL Team 2 when I checked in, I'm going to be dead at 30. And that was before 9-11, because we just, oh, Them's was the days. Even basic underwater demolition SEAL training, or BUDS as they call it, is the uh, best time of your life, worst time of your life, and that just continues on with the teams. And it's uh, uh, um, it, what by no means was SEAL Team 2 the worst time of my life. I just had a blast down there, move out to Virginia Beach. And um, yeah, man, just cool. Just basically grew up out there because you join, I joined the military as teenagers and most, uh, most dudes do most men and women join as teenagers for a lot of the same reasons. A lot of people, it's just common to say, I just got to get out of here uh, for, it doesn't matter where you grow up. People just say, I just got to get out of here. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, everything that we deal with in life and especially with social media, with the, with depression that kicks in and depression kicks in for everybody. Um, there's better alternatives than the, uh, taking the bad route. And I am an expert on the bad route, but also I'm pretty good at the good route. And I always tell people too, it doesn't matter what you're doing, man. If you, if you get to a bad spot, obviously I, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned all the time, call someone if you're having a bad day and that's important to reach out to people. It's important to get outside. It's important to get vitamin D, but if shit just goes sideways, man, go on an adventure. It's that simple. And, and the nice thing about the military, at least when I joined, in, uh, I, I joined in 1995, I actually left uh, in January. It's January now of uh, 1996 for boot camp, Great Lakes, Illinois. And, you know, you could just you could sign a few pieces of paper, get bullshitted by your uh, recruiter who's just filling his billets and, and then um, ship out. And worst case, you got, you know, three hots in a cot. You got a place to sleep if they let you sleep. I, I, I've never been to Marine Corps boot camp, especially at Paris Island. Never been. I've heard great things especially in the summertime. Um, but the, that's an adventure you can do. Or just, I mean, if you just need to just fuck everything off, t drain your savings if you're a dude and go to Thailand. Enjoy it. If you're a, if you're a girl, um, I would recommend uh, Norway or Sweden for obvious reasons. Um, or, you know, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. Man, go, go to Bimini and dive with tiger sharks or go on a safari in Africa. Do some shit like that. Stay away from some of these countries in the Middle East. Ah, uh, you know, usually some shit going on over there. It turns out we get uh, corrupt leaders in oil. In, they don't mix either. They always say water and oil don't mix. These are corrupt leaders in oil. We just keep fighting over the oil. And I, I said we fight in the Middle East as Americans because those damn people in the Middle East were just born on our oil. What the fuck? So, um, yeah, but um, 
go on an adventure if you need to, and that's what the operator is all about. Uh, so I started it with the book called The Operator, as in the life of the operator. But the more I've traveled, and I travel a lot, which is where I get some of my political views too. I can't say a lot of the stuff is that I say is scientific. I mean, there's stuff that's definitely scientific, like you know, like gravity. Even though, thanks to the World Wide Web, it's, it doesn't need to be. Um, but uh, um, the more I travel, the more I talk to people, the more I realize that everyone's their own vessel, and most people are just trying to get on with their own lives, that you are operating, too, if whatever you're doing. And I don't want to keep beating this dead horse every single time I talk to you, but I want you to know why I call The Operator Podcast that. And it's at The Operator Podcast on Instagram. <clears throat> get in there. Give me some comments. and. Um, I would like to hear what you have to say, and I'll read the comments. If I won't, I'll read some of them. On Twitter, I don't read them all the time, and I mention that too, and I will mute you but not block you. If you get blocked on Twitter, post that shit because I don't block people. <clears throat> I think it's dumb. I think if you, can't, if you can't just scroll past something that offends you, you're a, you're a weakling. If you can't hear something, be like, oh, that was stupid. <laughs> just not, you know, we don't need to fight each other, even though sometimes we feel like, because I'm guilty like the rest of us watching uh i watch a lot of uh i watch a lot of podcasts a lot of cable news i read a lot of books and i there are people with punchable faces that i don't see that write stuff and then whatever i'm sure that i'm sure that people want to punch me in the face as well which is fine but uh yeah i i, I got to travel around the world and i see that i i i've i talked to many different industries and just dealing with people uh, in sales, like an example of of how I can relate to people is the uh, salesman, because the salesman has a team behind him that's building the product, and then the salesman delivers, and that's kind of what we do in the military too. We have everyone behind it, every every piece of the pie that happens to get to your end result. That's um, <clears throat> that's uh, give it to the salesman, and then this, he sells it with us. The the uh, customer's always wrong. As a Navy SEAL, we just we didn't show up on accident most times. But when we did, we were good enough to um, not murder. Uh, I, I, I've been on podcasts recently with people who like to question. Well, you should question, and I don't blame people for questioning. Um, but uh, there are people out there who can't. But like I have a tomahawk. It was behind me. I think it fell over. Yeah, I can see it there. It fell over. And we started that, by the way, Red Team, uh, the tomahawk. And then I think... Uh, one of them got, they call it a breacher axe and one's called it a hatchet or some stuff like that. But, uh, there are like reporters and stuff out there that absolutely fucking literally love the idea of war crimes, especially Americans committing war crimes. I don't know. I don't know what kind of a boner you got to be to feel that way, but they're out there. And I, I did an interview uh, a week ago where they couldn't believe that I don't, well, I've never killed anyone with my tomahawk cause I never carried it because it's stupid. Why would I carry a tomahawk? I, I, I don't need it for anything. I mean, it's a close-in weapon. It's actually legal. If 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 I did, did kill someone with a tomahawk close in, sorry, reporters, it's legal. Welcome to fucking Camp Canoe, and don't let it hit you in the ass on the way out, and by the way, you can suck it. But uh, yeah, so I travel a lot, and I talk to a lot of people, and it's always fun because you don't need to believe the BS you see on television. I don't believe any of the polls. I don't believe anything that the media is, does or doesn't say. If you think about it, it all kinds of goes the news always goes up the chain and they're all kind of telling you the same thing a little bit to one audience, a little bit to the other, but they're full of it. But like I went down to, I flew down to um, uh, Orlando. I was in Orlando this weekend, which is awesome. And I, lo I love getting to Orlando, man. I'm all about the, you know, I'm good at putting politics aside in some things. And for me, the idea of Disney world is fun. I mean, obviously we all hate each other when we get there because we're all in it together and it's everything's expensive and everyone's, whatever but the idea is cool so i like getting into those hotels down there and whatnot i was i was with uh, my friend kevin julian uh, kj from um carrier enterprise and they, they do the uh hvac stuff and the air conditioning and all that and i so i got to hang out with them a little bit and then i right i gave a speech but right before i gave a speech i had uh one of my favorite dishes from room service is um eggs benedict mm, not this batch because uh, shit got rough that night for me. And I, I, uh, I, the flight home was good. I've been good about not puking on airplanes my entire career. Also, there's other, I have other fun facts about me about airplanes, but I'm not going to ruin that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's all mostly pleasant, some not. But uh, then we are headed, I'm flying again soon because hopefully you're going to come out to see me. Because I mentioned before, my first trip to SHOT Show will be on the 23rd, which is Tuesday. 
So SHOT Show Vegas booth 71123. I'm going to be with Watchtower Firearms. Uh, a bunch of the dudes will be there. It's gonna we got an awesome crew coming out there. Uh, I'm excited to get out there to Vegas. I don't plan on traveling. I'm probably going to avoid uh eggs benedict we'll see if i can do it from there because like it's one of those things where when you get sick and you think of the food and then all of a it kind of hits you like a what have you but uh yeah so shot show seven one one two three do come out there if you're in town because um i i guess it's fun i've heard it's great um and we'll see i'm gonna be there for not very long but uh, come find me that's where i'll be and it is a gun show so let's do this um uh, i'm also hoping because uh, of a gun show, I want to see what's going on. There's there's a, a company called Muddy River Tactical, which is a very cool story. I, I wonder if they're going to be out there. I got to get in touch with them. But uh, Kevin Mason's the owner. He's got a great story. If you go check out Muddy River Tactical, muddyrivertactical.com, because um, he was uh, he was he wasn't getting the quality holsters that he wanted. Uh, or the customer service. So we started Muddy River Tactical, and these things are just awesome. There's, uh, you know, there's inside the outside um, tactical holsters, um, Kydex leather. There's specialty holsters like um, saddlebags for your bike or uh, uh, EDC dump tray. You ever seen those? Because like, if you got some valuables, there's nothing wrong keeping your money next to your gun. Uh, but these these uh, high end, high quality. I, I mean, the finish is awesome. I got a couple of them. They're great. They look cool. They work. They're phenomenal. They used um, computer numerical control, CNC, which is a machine that gets them down to the science of, even if you did them by hand, it wouldn't be quite as good as these. They're all made in the USA, family-owned company, kick-ass holsters, uh, precision engineer using these CNC machines. Um, like I said, inside the waistband, outside the waistband, high-quality stuff. There's a uh, no BS lifetime warranty on Muddy River Tactical. 15-day uh, risk-free trial if... If, if the customer doesn't love it, you get a full refund back. So you can follow them on Facebook or Instagram, Muddy River Tactical, or the website is muddyrivertactical.com. And you, you can uh, use code the operator, save 15%. So muddyrivertactical.com, 15% with code the operator. And also check out that website because they, uh, um, Kevin Mason, the owner, didn't, um, he said with the um, customer service, uh, they they monitor emails, eighteen hours a day, seven days a week. At you know, so go check out Muddy River Tactical. Use code the operator. Get some uh, kick ass gear. I, I'm excited for everything I'm going to see at Shot Show. The stuff that you, uh, when you do need it but don't have it, um, it's not going to be a good day. So you need to stay prepared with stuff like that. Just how are you going to take care of yourself and your family? How are you going to take care of your house, your neighbors, even if if you, you know, if it doesn't get bad enough that you need to eat them, how are you going to help them take care of each other? But preparedness is. I'm going to get into more of that too later on today. We got a couple different things to talk about. Um, just with uh, the overall preparedness is one of the key points of success as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, and um, one of the ways to stay prepared is make sure that you can feed people. And, you know, obviously you got to make sure you can get, uh, it's not, it's not a bad idea to have ways to get water, be um, able to find and get this stuff. And, I hope you can handle the truth. A lot of people say you can't handle the truth, but the truth is that clowns running this joint live for chaos. I talk about chaos all the time. I think they feed off of chaos. Many of our problems could be solved overnight, but they let them be because destruction and stuff, it fuels the clowns. If you can handle the truth, though, you need to visit my website, preparewithrob.com. Go check out preparewithrob.com. You'll get $60 off a much-needed four-week emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply. The country's largest preparedness company, My Patriot Supply, is your fighting chance at survival. Sealed inside rugged packaging, these delicious, and I mean delicious, meals last up to 25 years and provide over 2,000 calories per day. Eat right in emergencies with this four-week food kit from My Patriot Supply, and at this low price, you can get one for everyone in your family. You can get it at preparewithrob.com. Go to preparewithrob.com, and if you order by 3 p.m., you will get same-day shipping. So prepare right now for you and your family at preparewithrob.com. Do that before total chaos ensues. And along with preparedness, I really need you to check out Allegiance Gold. 
Uh, very serious to have currency that you can use. It's tangible that you can use in case of the, you know, the dollar crashing. And unless you've been living in a cave or a Hamas tunnel, you know that we're on the verge of full-blown war. World War III is right around the corner. And Biden's policies have left us with financial problems we haven't seen in half a century. Inflation is killing our savings, and we're looking at two possible interest rate hikes that have professionals like Warren Buffett and Jeremy Grantham, who predicted three major crashes, worried. Don't want to worry those guys about finances, but that's what they are. This means your savings and retirement are in serious trouble. Don't risk it. Secure your retirement with Allegiance Gold. Whether you prefer physical gold and silver or simply want to protect your IRA or 401k, you can trust the professionals at Allegiance Gold. They've earned the highest trust ratings in the precious metals industry, and their relationships are based on integrity, expertise, and impeccable service. Just this year, central banks bought over 800 tons of gold with China leading the way. Imagine that. This is not an accident. Don't put it off any longer. Go to protectwiththeoperator.com protectwiththeoperator.com or call them at 844-790-9191 844-790-9191 get up to $5,000 in free silver with a qualifying purchase protect your future now with Allegiance Gold protectwiththeoperator.com protectwiththeoperator.com or call Allegiance Gold at 844 844- Seven nine zero nine one nine one. But it is election time, whether you like it or not. I keep saying that. I seriously, I think I say that every episode. It's always election time. But it is getting exciting. Uh, you may not have heard, but um, they held the caucus in Iowa last night, which was um, was really good for Trump. Donald Trump won it huge. I think it was, the, it was a re- record-setting win for the Iowa caucus. And the caucus, again, is uh, you need to be registered in that party to vote. So you need to be a registered Republican to show up. And this is odd now. Listen, No, I'm going to talk slowly so people understand this. You're required to show up in person with ID. And if you're an independent, you need to switch to a Republican in order to vote in the caucus. So showing up with ID. And if you'll notice, they knocked that out in one night. Hmm. You can show up in person, and we can have it done in one night. It is 2024, but the year just started, so who knows? Big, big year. Um, So Donald Trump won big, and Ron DeSantis took second, and Nikki Haley took third. You'd never guess by hearing him talk. I mean, can you imagine finishing third like that and be like, oh, what a great day, and it's a two-man race now, whatever the hell she said. Um, Yeah, whatever. I got, you know. I have my own feelings. I'm a, I wouldn't be allowed to vote in a caucus because I am not a Republican. I am a registered independent, just so we're very clear. But there was some fun there. Not there, but there was some fun around the country be, because just trying to say what they can about Donald Trump. It's actually, it's it's almost turned pathetic. Um, MSNBC anchor Rachel Maddow explained to viewers after it was... Um, after Donald Trump won, why they refused to air former President Trump's speech after his landslide win in Iowa. Uh, he, they said that MSNBC can't air, couldn't air lies. And she said, at this point in the evening, the projected winner of the Iowa caucuses has just started giving his victory speech. And she said that without mentioning Donald Trump by name. That's classy. That's news right there. She said, uh, she continued, we will, con- uh, we will keep an eye on this as that happens. We will let you know if there is any news made in the speech, if there's anything noteworthy, something substantive and important. That's what she's saying, that they will uh, do that because MSNBC and all other news outlets are interested in telling the truth. I'm going to call that bullshit right there, but hey. Um, let's see. The reason I'm saying this, of course, continued Maddow, there is... Um, There's a reason that we and other news organizations have generally stopped giving an unfiltered live platform to remarks by former President Trump. She didn't mention him then. It's not out of spite. It's not a decision we relish. It is a decision that we regularly revisit and honestly, earnestly, and it's an easy decision. Well, that and the fact that they they are completely loon with uh, Trump derangement syndrome. 
Uh, Matto went on to claim that airing Trump's untrue statements live on television hurts MSNBC's brand. I think it kind of just sticks with MSNBC's brand. Um, but there's a cost to us and uh, as a news organization of knowingly broadcasting untrue things that is fundamental truth of our business, who we are. And so his remarks tonight will not air here live. We will monitor them and let you know about any news he makes. Okay, well, airing the truth. That's kind of weird, airing the truth. And they're always there's big on to airing, airing the truth about what, though? Um, he, I mean, he, he won the, he won the caucus and Iowa was counted in one whole night. You know, isn't that weird too, when they air the truth, but they couldn't quite knock out, I don't know, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Nevada, Michigan, and Wisconsin in one night. We had to just keep that going for a little while to make sure I didn't say it. Um, and then, okay. So Trump wins that and he's going on in New Hampshire and that is going to be, uh, uh, um, uh, primary. So the caucus says you got to be in the thing, and New Hampshire is having a primary, and that's where anyone can vote. And so the Democrats have a plan. And I'm not. I've, I will never accuse the Democrats of not being organized. They're very organized. And um, oh, New Hampshire is the one on the right. So Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, just in case. Um, and here, here's the plan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little. Uh, I almost said gee dunk. I'm not giving you any gee dunk. I'm going to give you a little scuttlebutt here. The reason Nikki Haley is so fired up, and she does have uh, certain governors and whatnot that are supporting her and a shitload of uh, government contractors are supporting her. And what what the Democrats are going to do is they're going to go vote for Nikki Haley because it's not a vote for Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis, and she's the closest thing to a swamp monster that they're going to find. She, Nikki Haley, although... Um, you know, she's she's qualified and she's educated and she def definitely knows people. She's as close to one of the far left uh, swamp monsters that you're going to find. So they're going to try to get Nikki Haley because when they win, when she finishes second, maybe third in New Hampshire, because Trump's going to win that, too. Um, they got to go to South Carolina and she was the governor of that state. She's going to get absolutely fucking demolished down there. And then that should be it. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy came out. Boy, he came out fired up, too. Yesterday, last night, uh, Trump brought him out because Trump went in between going um, back to court for complete bullshit. Uh, he, he does get up to New Hampshire and Ramaswamy came out. I'm thinking, man, he might be the he might be the, the pit bull now because he's uh, people are liking him. They like the way he handles people. They like the the OK, maybe not. They I like the way he handles like uh, people who stand up and scream about issues instead of getting them kicked out. He gives them the microphone. That's great. Smart enough. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see him now that he's not running for president, but he's endorsing Trump. It's going to be fascinating, South Carolina. So, um, yeah, politics. I, I was I was digging through stuff because, like I said, I, I I like to research. I found an interesting um, an interesting tweet from President Biden, and uh, it was he uh, it actually wasn't even president yet. Um, in twenty twenty, uh, th th uh, March. 2020 it says as president i will always choose hope over fear unity over division truth over lies and science over fiction i i i saw that because it jumped out at me and i would i want to hear from you i, I want to hear what you have to say about this because you got msnbc and cnn msnbc well like in the view too uh and they're just saying how the lies the lies and they spew the lies and the extreme mag of the lies if if truth but if Biden before he won in 2020 was saying he will always choose hope over fear. Okay. Unity over division, like the, the device of his hell. Look at the way they're dividing everybody by uh, everything they can think of. Um, mainly race, but also sex. Um, whatever sex you choose, you can be that, that division. Ageism, um, if you're handicapped. They're trying to divide you. So they're not, this is not inclusive at all. This is division. It's divide and conquer. It's a communist tactic. But the thing that gets me is that how they can always say truth over lies and science over fiction. Science over fiction. Boys have penises. Go. Science. But no, that's not the narrative. And that's the shit they put out. But we, we refuse to put lies on our, on, all they do is put lies out there. That's all nonsense. T tell that to the girl that got her teeth knocked out playing a dude that said he was a girl in the cross. 
That's, I mean, you're lying. It's unsafe. But, um, and then they, 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 and here's what they have, and you're going to hear this over and over ad nauseum. Extreme MAGA. Okay. Extreme MAGA. What, okay, what does that mean? Okay. So Make America Great is an extremist, is a, is a, is a, a, a domestic terrorist because we the people, you believe in we the people, and that it doesn't mean we the Irish Americans. It's not it ain't we the African Americans. It's not we the Asian Americans. It's we the people, and the documents written for all of us. The, the uh, ultra mega, as or extreme mega, whatever they like to say, is is fascist because we want to seal the southern border because of the incredible amount of deaths from fentanyl coming over. I'm trying not to get back into this because you've heard it before. The the human trafficking, the sex slave trade, the amount of money we're pumping or we're facilitating the pumping of money into these dangerous cartels that are going to come here. Allowing fighting age males, military age males, mams, as we would say back in the day, ma'am. Ma'am means something different now. Sometimes ma'am means dude. But um, so we want it, we want we want to lower crime. We we want to be harder on criminals. I saw uh, uh, like an eight time felon just knock the piss out of some lady on the subway. Didn't kill her, but I think put her in ICU. We don't need that guy in the streets. I mean, he needs help too. I'm not saying he needs to be uh, doing hard labor, but for the love of God, we we want to avoid crime. We want people to have a living wage. We want people to be able to afford stuff because um, in you know inflation. How how long I'm asking people because I, I have an issue with this. How how long <clears throat> how many times do you need to go to the grocery store to realize you're spending way too much money? And it's all because of the inflation. It's all because of BS policies from not even lawmakers, just from swamp rats in Washington, DC. You I, the the issue that we're having, and you gotta you just hear me out. If we 50% of this country is in an assembly line. And they get bullshit pumped into them, and as long as it's repeated, they start to believe it. How 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 can they tell you Bidenomics is working, and you go to the grocery? Do not go to the grocery store. Do you not see? So anyway, they're calling, uh, and they 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 are the kings and queens of admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations because MAGA is fascist. Well, who, which is the party trying to keep the leading candidate off the ballot in? Several different states. Secretaries of state are trying to keep Donald Trump off the ballot. Or they're trying to put him in jail. They're trying to destroy his business. They're weaponizing the Department of Justice. They're, they've weaponized the FBI, the CIA. And you pick your three letters, DOJ, FBI, CIA. Um, they censor. <laughs> you can't. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza puts out 2,000 mules and you can't even find it. That's censorship. They manipulate with the media over and over and over. They tell you the same stuff. The people that freak out about Donald Trump can't tell me why. Policy-wise, you don't like him, whatever. I don't know. I don't. I mean, even okay. Even when we're talking about uh, truth over lies and science over what, whatever they say. Um, so Joy Reid was on MSNBC, and she said Nikki Haley lost because she is Sikh American. Um, and that's stretch. That's a stretch. And I was surprised Joy Reid was actually bad mouthing Donald Trump because she was wearing a wig that looked just like Trump hair. I thought it was awesome. Having said that, I've never met Joy Reid, so I'm not trying. I'm not trying to be rude. Um, but she, here's what she said too: trying to report the truth. She's still a brown lady that has to try to win in a party that is deeply anti-immigrant. She's getting birthered by Donald Trump. All right, and there's a huge difference between wanting a secure border and being anti-immigrant. Pro-immigration is fine legally, but letting how many millions of people that we know about come into this country, when's it going to bite us in the ass? We just finished the Iowa caucus, right? And Iowa, I don't know if you noticed, is a, it's a, a middle state. It's not, it doesn't have a border with a foreign country. Their number one concern was illegal immigration. It's affecting them in Iowa. They should be worried about corn. By the way, I just went to Iowa a couple months ago, and their corn kicks ass. I'm here to say it. I actually, I actually have a recipe because I'm a big crock pot guy to make my own cream corn. If you want it, tell me in the comments. I'm not sure I can sell it to you because um, I'm restricted on some of those platforms. Maybe I'll just share it. If enough people want to know how to make great cream corn, or if you're just heading to Iowa and you want to impress your 
Scandinavian American friends. I can I can gladly do that. But yeah, that's what they're they're literally saying. Nikki Haley is a brown lady getting birthed by Donald Trump. This is the bullshit they'll say, but they can only report the truth. Nonsense. And uh, here's the thing: I mentioned how I travel quite a bit, and I do a lot. And I get to talk to people face to face, and it's great. Here's the frustrating part, and I'm gonna say it kind of quietly because you know I've been to jail and I hate it. But um, people are catching on to the constant lying by these talking heads. And <laughs> there's there's no way, there is no, there is no way. I mean, Biden's out there on Twitter begging, e-begging for money. I thought he got 81 million votes. Why does he need to beg for money? He's doing it. The one of those little stupid, hey, I'm, well, sorry, he's not doing it. Whoever writes his tr- Twitter is do or his ex is doing it for him. Um, so you would ask, I mean, why is, uh, if he got that many votes, a world, world record, the most popular president in the history of the universe, why is, uh, why is he begging for money? It's almost like they cheat. We can do all this in one night. We can, we can vote in person in one night, but then I'm okay. So that we're, we're, we're rolling down the, the left part of the aisle here. I don't know why, but. Um, just, just because the, the thing that jumped out at me was the truth over fiction. Okay, you know what's going on now? Davos. It's a place in Europe. Gorgeous. It's where they all fly in private jets to talk about us, uh, we the scumbags, uh, how we shouldn't be flying, we should be eating bugs, we got to kill all the, the cows because the meat turns into f- lava or what? I don't know. It does something. But uh, there was a, um, John Kerry who was the climate czar. I don't even know what that means. I know you get paid a lot. He gets paid a lot. These these uh, uh, climate hijackers are worth a lot of money. You should see their private jet. Seriously, worth looking. But there was a dude um, interviewing them. So John Kerry's wandering around with his entourage, and he's asking, he's at, just asking, like, you come here every year, um, nothing's changed, why are you, whatever. And, and Kerry's answer was, that's a stupid question. Um, it, it's blatantly obvious they don't even believe their own BS anymore. But they're going to tell it to us. And guess what? If we're good little workers and we line up and we listen to it over and over again, uh, hacks like Greta Thunberg can come yell at people. He yelled at the UN too. Another waste of space. Anyway, so Al Gore's over there with John Carradine. Uh, They're both over there because they go every year and they uh, um, they don't have any really a narrative, but they have all the dates for carbon neutral. And they usually say it's going to be in 30 years. They're giving you dates. Close enough for you to be concerned, but long enough for you to be dead when they happen and you can actually uh, be proven wrong. It's like whatever, 2050, we're going to be whatever. Um, and, our, you know, Arctic ice declined in, in the mid-2000s, but it's been stable since. I'm not a scientist. I'm not, I'm not an expert on client science. I'm just a, just, a, <laughs> just a dude trying to report what I'm saying here. Um, what did uh, Al Gore say a while back? I, I wrote down some quotes here. He said... This is a couple of years ago, just to prove that this is these are a few of the things he said that the time actually did pass where he, you know, everything was going to kill us. He said, uh, we're still putting 162 million tons of greenhouse gas into it, the atmosphere, every single day. And the accumulated amount is now trapping as much extra heat as would be re- released by 600,000 Hiroshima class atomic bombs exploding every single day on Earth. He also said, that's what, okay, pay pay attention to this part here and tell me he's telling you the truth. That's what's boiling the oceans, creating these atmospheric rivers on the, uh, what does it say? Uh, And the rain bombs, uh, sucking the moisture out of the land and creating the droughts, melting the ice, raising sea level and causing these waves of climate refugees. Oh, there's a good one. You can blame the southern border on climate change. They blame a lot of stuff on climate change. They said that's the number one uh, issue with our... um, National security. But um, I'm just kind of going through here. Here's the one that I put in in uh, boldface, too, because it, it really jumped at me. Uh, Gore then noted a prediction that the number of climate refugees worldwide would surge to a billion within a century. And then he said, such a surge would lead to nations losing their capacity for self-governance. Hmm. So that sounds to me like we might need, I don't know, a new world order, a world economic forum. Oh, they're all there in Davos talking about this, talking about you. And there's nothing you can do about it because the media is not going to tell you. 
Here's another one. Gore said at a speech in Copenhagen at the climate conference in 2009, we're still here, that was 2009, that there was a 75% chance that the entire North Pole ice cap during some, some of the southern months could be completely ice-free within the next five to seven years. So he does this a lot, but five to seven years from 2009, we're working on eh, 2014, shit, we're fucked. Um, in his show that the um, schools were forced to teach kids back in the day, not even this generation of college kids, it was before, uh, it's called an inconvenient truth. Gore predicted that the global sea level rise uh, could be as much as 20 feet in the near future. So since uh, 1880, the global sea, ri- sea has risen 8 to 9 inches since 1880. And between 1993 and 2021, the sea level has ticked up about 3.8 inches. That's according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That's four letters, so maybe they're not full of shit. Uh, at this rate... It would take approximately 1,136 years for the world's sea level to rise 20 feet. So he's lying again. Uh, Gore also claimed in 2006 there would be no solving climate change. He actually called it global warming back then, but he had to change that because it wasn't warming. It's just, um, I don't know, there were seasons, so now it's climate change, not global warming. They can do that, though. They can change it because they always tell you the truth. Uh, Gore also claimed in 2006 there would be no solving climate change if drastic measures weren't taken around the world to reduce greenhouse gas by 2016. However, uh, annual global carbon emissions increased from 30.59 billion tons in 2006 to 35.52 billion tons in 2016 and 37.12 billion tons in 2021. Um, that's according to some global carbon people. So uh, wrong again, but uh, sea level increases are going to continue no matter what we do now, but we can prevent much larger. So we're saying it's going to happen, but can we keep it smaller? Because it's going to happen. And I didn't say it was going to overtake it, but I said it's going to ha- That's. I mean, this is the same nonsense. The same nonsense. And half of us are listening to it. But yeah, the climate, man, it does get, I guess it gets cold and it gets hot. Um, did you see the, well, the, the answer obviously is the uh, electric vehicles. That's what, They're also going to do that by forcing you to do that. They're going to force people to have electric vehicles. But they learned in Chicago this weekend that that's not that good of an idea, not that not a great idea, uh, because it turns out it gets cold in Chicago. I think they call it the Windy City. Also, there's a big lake there. Um, someone was saying uh, it's not it's not a plug and go. It's uh, you have to precondition your battery, meaning you have to get the battery up to optimal temperature to accept a fast charge. So, when, you know, and I was saying this earlier, like I, road trips, what you know, they it sort of sucks driving depending on your your crew. But even how annoying it is to pull into a, a gas station and there's a line or something and you can't get in right away, you're pissed. But imagine if you had to go there and like charge your car for two hours, but now you can't because there's other people there trying to charge, charge their cars for two hours, but it's colder now too, so the charge doesn't last as long. And now the electric um, stuff you got to plug into to charge your car doesn't work because it's too cold. It's almost like these won't work. It's almost like they won't work. Uh, it's almost like these batteries that are made f- from child labor, child slave labor, by people digging in unsafe conditions in Africa with their hands, and everything's made in China. They don't work, but we're doing it for some reason because it's almost like someone's so corrupt they need to do whatever China says. Weird. But yeah, that didn't happen there, and then they're shitting purple Twinkies down in Texas because it got below 20 degrees and they just don't know how to act. <laughs> um but I mean, it's not you know not as bad as Chicago. But again, just seeing the uh, the climate changes, the weather changes. I don't know. I'm not an expert. I'm giving you my opinion, and I want to hear your opinion. Um, I want to talk about something that happened overseas because it is a dangerous world now. Because when there's a weak America, there's a very very uh, aggressive world. Aggression loves weakness, and that's what we're seeing, especially in the Red Sea. Gulf of Aden, you're seeing in the Arabian Gulf, the Persian Gulf, whatever. The uh, the the Suez Canal is very very narrow. If they're hitting missiles, if they're hitting ships with missiles in the Red Sea, they can really hit you on the on the side of the ship. I've been to the Suez. I actually hit some golf balls off the USS John F. Kennedy, which I think is mothballed now. It was a CV CV sixty seven. 
But it's getting dangerous over there with the Hamas thing, and now terrorists can use the excuse of Israel being an occupier and the Palestinians being occupied and they're oppressed and Israel's is oppressor. And now we have a generation of kids who have, who've been taught that Osama bin Laden might have been right, and they're being taught the... I've obviously never been there, is what I'm getting at. It would actually be comical to watch some of these ass clowns go over to um, Gaza. But they won't. They'll just sit here and uh, interrupt travel. They'll park outside JFK and block traffic. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll march and protest and bang their stupid drums outside of uh, cancer hospitals in New York, which they've done, which that's going to solve it. But um, th so it's, it's splitting and you've got these uh, weapons being transferred from Iran into Yemen because there's a band called the Houthis, which are just Iranians. And uh, I mean, imagine the level of incompetence we're at right now in the military where you get these um, lines or formations of dudes that are terrorists and they're marching and talking about the USA and the mountains are bigger in Yemen it's like, God, if you give me a day and authorization and a fucking A-10. There you are, tough guy. God, that would be awesome. But we don't because we're weak. And we have people making decisions for presidents based purely on politics, purely on party power. Not for you. Not for we the people. Half of you think he's doing a, Not even half, though. I don't know why I keep saying half of you because even the approval ratings on some of these uh, stations just... <laughs> they're bad and you i mean okay please also in the comments at the operator podcast on instagram or do on twitter um that would be at mikuya m-c-h-o-o-y-a-h but uh tell me what this administration has done that you like tell me one thing i'm listening i would like to know i am an american i'm all about we the people i just don't want like the parties but it's, uh, yeah, so you got the Houthis over there. Iranians are moving money. They're doing it through the land bridge, um, through Iraq, into different parts of the Middle East, and then they're moving them by sea. Uh, and they move them in boats. Com a common boat over in that part of the world is called a dhow. And it's a, uh, I didn't look up the measurements. I've been on a few dhows. We used to, uh, back when we were high-speed Navy SEALs before 9-11, we would take down ships full of dates, like the food, because... They were dates, uh, but they're trans. These sh boats are common. Tr these boats are co uh, common transferring stuff over there. But one of the things they're using the Dows for is the Iranians are sending missiles to the Houthis, and they're, sh they're I mean they're shooting some serious missiles at ships. They hit that one. They had a ship this weekend. It was on fire, and we're not going to get the truth out of uh, the level of damage because you can see the damn thing on fire. You can see the. The uh, fire boats, the fire putter outer boats there, but you know, no, no minimal damage. Big fire, minimal damage. But um, we had an issue with uh, with um, SEAL Team Three. They were doing underways, and an underway is when you usually go from um, a boat to another boat. So a smaller boat comes up to a bigger boat, and you can hook it and you can climb with a ladder, and that's called visit board search and seizure. I used to call it vessel boarding search and seizure, but they change stuff every time, like battlefield interrogator turned to tactical questioner, stuff like that. But uh, they're visit board search and seize, and there are tactics that go along with that. And it's it's it is uh, it, special forces are are uh, capable of doing this mission. It is Navy SEALs bread and butter. It is SEAL Team Six bread and butter, and we train on that thing all the damn time, and. Uh, it's a it's a tricky operation because the uh, it's not just a video game where you're on your rib or H sac or what have you whatever boat you have high speed craft um, you're not just there and hooking you're like it's how did you get there how long did it take you to get there um, for uh, for example when we when we rescued Richard Phillips from Somali pirates it was a uh, sixteen hour flight. Um, and not quite 16 hour flight, but it was 16 hours ish, um, in order to get on station. So everything that goes along with that in our case, because we're going to jump, it was, um, you get the call, the boats need to be packed, rigged with shoots already. 
and you need someone to be driving the big trucks to get them over there. So you're going to need CBs for that. The riggers to make sure, like I said, the boats are rigged and all the rigs that you're going to jump are already packed. You're not. We can pack our stuff, and Lord knows we had enough time going over, but there's no need to if the riggers had them packed. That to be a main and a reserve water chute. They got to be there. Um, your gear had better be packed already because you don't know when the call is going to come, and that shit better be tight because – the time that you need to be from here to there goes a lot faster, especially when you're selling it for years. Um, then, you know, it's, it's everything from, from your, your, your weapon. Now, here's the thing, too, that people would, some people would skip. Not all the time, but sometimes just to cut corners, which you can't. This is a big one. It's called, we call it a dip test. And uh, I used to like to do it in the pool. And that's when you put on everything you're going to jump in, including your gun, all your bullets, all your foo-foo shit you're going to bring with you. Jump in. Do I sink? If the answer is yes, you better remedy that. If the answer is no, you're good because you are more buoyant in salt water than you are in the pool. But the reason the dip test sucks is because you're jumping in with all your gear. Okay, now I'm done. Now I get out. What do I need to do? I need to clean all my gear to include my magazines, to include my gun, take it apart, make sure it's you know smooth. Obviously, a fresh water rinse, and then you got to make sure it's you got your whatever lube. You like to use, and then um, then you got to make sure all your stuff's packed, include everything from your night vision to your black buffalo to whatever you're going to jump with, and it's got to be ready to rock and roll. Then, in our case, you get to the thing, you fly where you're going. Then you have to do. Um, I was a jump master and a tandem master on the Captain Phillips raid, so uh, you're doing jump master personnel inspections for everywhere, everybody up to it, including the commanding officer who did the jump with us. Tandem master, tandem checking everyone that I was the lead jumper. Got to make sure your shit's together. Um, and then hope the boat's open, the parachute's open. And um, then there, and then you got to find the boats, get in the boats, and then you got to stock. I'm not going to get into that tactic, but that can take hours of diesel fuel and, and sitting in the waves and puking. Um, it's been at that point, you know, it's been a full day, 24 hours or whatever. Then you got to climb. So how have you been preparing before you climb? Uh, how's your cardio? That's why you got to get in shape. Um, climbing is not the easiest either. That's the hardest part because when we would train at SEAL team six, we usually, well, we didn't plan it this way, but it usually worked out that the weather just sucked. So Picture yourself, and we would do it on uh, uh, Navy ships and cruise liners and shit like that, but it, a lot of the bigger ships don't move too much in, um, in, the, uh, in the ocean, but the little ones will, and you got to pull up next to them, so you got to ride the wave. So now just bear with me. If you hooked a boat and you have a ladder now, say you have a ladder to the top of the boat, and but there's waves, and it's smashing into another ship or a boat, um, you need to time it. So when you're on top of the wave, that's when you grab as high as you can on the ladder and then hold on, hopefully with both hands, and then the boat's gone. It's 10 feet below you or 15 feet below you, depending on the waves. Now your ass better climb up in case the even bigger swell hits you. Now you're climbing. You got to get up and over. You got to secure the ladder because like the lead uh, climber and security will go up, secure that. Then you get everybody up. You've done that entire process. Now it's time to work, Right. You better be in good shape. This is why we work out. This is why Bud's selection, why it's hard. This is why we this is why we take the best of the best. This is why um, we have equal opportunity. You have an equal opportunity to try out on day one. If you're not good, we shit can you. That's the way it needs to stay. There are standards for a reason. It's the same reason we were in the Korangal Valley on top of that mountain looking for Marcus Luttrell, and we said this is why training is so hard because if we were going to quit now, where are we going to go? The answer is nowhere. You're going to win or you're going to die. That's it. And this is uh, – I'm, I'm, I get a little emotional with this because um, – just because of the standards in the military are not, not – now, um, the standards in the military are, are getting – Less and less, and they're, they're concentrating on stuff that's not important. We've talked about that before. I'll address it again later. But um, we, we need to be as good as we can. What happened here on the down, I was not on this mission, obviously. I was in Florida. But um, I, I guess one of the guys fell off, and then another guy f- jumped after him. That's the word I got, the two Navy SEALs from SEAL Team 3. Uh, and they said the guy that fell off – um, what, he was a new guy, so assuming his first platoon overseas. But what a new guy means to me is complete physical stud. 
This guy finished buds a year, year and a half ago. This guy can climb. This guy's in great shape. I don't know what happened. And I, it breaks my heart to hear that you fell in the ocean. Because I've, I've done a lot of these um, training. I've done like a handful for real. But even training on a, 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 even going from Navy ship to Navy ship at night in high seas, it gets sketch on that ladder, man. That's some serious shit. And if people tell you that you don't have a pucker factor, you do. I'm not saying you're scared doing that, but that's when you're on the ladder in the middle thinking, did I do a dip test? I hope I don't sink. So there's you got a lot in your mind, and it's it's we train on that all the time, and it's scary and it sucks. Falling in, I can't imagine. Uh, they haven't found these guys yet, and I'm I mean both studs. I I don't know. I don't. I'm not going to say who they are, but um, I don't think you survive that long in the water. Even if it's 80 degrees in the water, you're going to get hypothermia eventually. And you know we just there are standard operating procedures that go along with it too. It's it's the the process of if you. After you do your dip test, but if you didn't, if you find yourself sinking, there are ways to jettison your body armor if you're wearing it. Some guys don't. Um, then you got to find – well, there's places where you keep your flare, night end up, if it's nighttime. Day end up, that's another – one more crack at whatever. But the, the thing that got me um, – the thing that got me with this too is uh, they said the second guy fe- jumped in after him, which is their standard operating procedure, their SOP. And I, I, I don't ever remember that being an SOP. I think if, if one guy falls in, we can try to find him with the boat. I don't think another guy needs to jump in. That was never our SOP. They might have changed it. I don't know how it, it changes. Um, and it breaks my heart for these guys because they, they completed the mission, the team did, and they found the weapons, and they sunk the boat, and they got the bad guys, and that's awesome, and they mission success. But, man, I, I just hate it that we, uh, we had some, some dudes fall in, and I, I, hope they, I hope they recover. I'll hold out hope. Um, um, it just it just sucks, but the the point of that whole thing is if you got a bud stud like that, uh, uh, and I don't you know I hate calling him a new guy. He's overseas and all that stuff, and he's a badass. If you got two dudes going in the water, man, that's some uh, that's some really intense atmospheric conditions and waves. And it, it that but the point is if a guy like that is capable of getting swept over by a wave, imagine if we start getting into equity, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. We have to have a certain amount of certain people on that ladder. Can you imagine the chaos? That's not what our military is for. Our military is not about command climate. Yes, we all get along, but that's because we are, we're all adults. We don't need to be forced all this crap. We don't need to be forced with these, these trendy TikTok videos trying to recruit people. That's not what Navy SEALs do. That's not what Marines do. Infantry Rangers don't do that. They don't do it at Delta. But you got to maintain that. That's why this whole thing that I'm saying kind of comes back to telling the truth. We have so many people out there that are lying to you. Because at some point somewhere, it made someone feel good or it made some, you know, loudmouth at home who daddy didn't pay enough attention to growing up and they have to cry like a goddamn baby. And it's ruining a lot of things. And I hate to say it, but half the people still buy it. Um, it's Yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it, it broke my heart. It's a crappy way for the weekend. I, and I, like I said, I, I pray for the family and I, um, yeah, I, I mean, it just uh, completely sucks. So uh, keep them, keep them in your in your thoughts and prayers. However you do that, and just just I mean, knowing how see it's so it's so unstable overseas right now. Imagine being a wife or a mother or a father, friend, teammate. Teammates are right there with them. And teammates at SEAL team, members of SEAL team are as close as any team there is. And just losing someone that because you know it's unstable now. You know the world's unstable ever since we well. There's been a shit ton of bad decisions made. Uh, but, you know, we leave Afghanistan. We show weakness everywhere. We bow down to everything. We prove corruption. That's just, uh, this, this, this is just a bad way to go. And if you're part of that family and you're just worried about them, because, man, I mean, you, where are they going? These are Navy SEALs. They're, they're going to go to the Middle East. What does that mean? That could mean anything. We got dudes in, in Syria and Iraq still. We got guys in Israel. Do we have guys in Iran and Afghanistan? I hope not. But, I mean, that's coming. But they, I mean, they're freely sending missiles, flipping us the bird. But if you can maintain your standard operating procedures and keep an A-10 above you, you're never out of the fight.